It's great to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, for our visitors and for those who may not recognize me because of my haircut from this week, <laughs> Uh, I'm the interim pastor here, David Wong. Uh, as part of my pastoral duties, uh, I, I had asked uh, one of the, um, my friends, I said, uh, you know, what's the worst thing you've done to a person? And that uh, individual said, well, mine is when I asked someone if they got a haircut, and after they said, yeah, I said nothing. So... <laughs> <laughs> this morning we will uh, continue and we will finish our study of the book of Ruth. And as you know, the book of Ruth is pointing us to Christ, but it's also a story of, uh, teaching us about God's providence. God using natural events to, for his supernatural results. And so before we start our study of chapter 4, which is the last chapter of the book of Ruth. Uh, let's briefly summarize again uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, the book of Ruth, it takes place during one of the darkest periods in Jewish history. Uh, the period of the judges, a time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, there was a famine in Bethlehem. Uh, Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Malon and Kilion, uh, then moved from Bethlehem, the promised land, and they sojourned to a neighboring land, a pagan land called Moab. While in Moab, Elimelech dies, uh, his two sons marry two foreign women, two Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah, and after 10 years, the two sons eventually also die in Moab, leaving Ruth and Moab with uh, Ruth and Orpah with no children. Uh, Naomi hears that the famine is ending in Moab, um, uh, ending in uh, Bethlehem. So uh, Naomi decides to move from Moab back to Bethlehem. Uh, during that time, Naomi selflessly convinces Orpah to stay in Moab, and she does that. Ruth, on the other hand, um, does not stay in Moab. She clings to Naomi and goes with Naomi back to Bethlehem. So Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem as financially poor widows with the potential of their name ending with them because they have no heirs. Uh, Naomi and Ruth are in need of both family, but also food. Ruth happens to glean in the field owned by a relative uh, of Elimelech named Boaz. <laughs> Naomi realizes that Boaz might be their kinsman redeemer, which is the Hebrew words for Goel, a man designated in the Mosaic law to have the right to rescue a close relative to help them keep their land but also to extend their family line. Boaz takes notice of Ruth gleaning in his fields. Boaz keeps his young men from harassing and insulting uh, Ruth, but Boaz also allows Ruth to eat and drink um, and eat where his, his young men are drinking and eating from. Naomi, the, na the matchmaker, uh, tells Ruth to wash, anoint, and put on her cloak and go down to the threshing floor where the grain is separated from its husk. And Ruth complies and lays down where Boaz is laying down and uncovers Boaz's feet. Uh, Ruth then boldly announces that uh, to Boaz that he is a redeemer, and Ruth proposes to Boaz by asking Boaz to spread his wings over her. Boaz acknowledges he is a redeemer, but then there's a huge letdown because Boaz acknowledges that there is a redeemer in line before Boaz. 
Boaz then tells Ruth that the nearer redeemer is not willing to be Ruth's redeemer. Boaz promises he will redeem Ruth. So today is the day we're going to find out who will be redeeming Naomi and Ruth. Is it going to be Boaz or is it going to be someone else? God's already answered Naomi and Ruth's prayer for food. Now God is about to answer their prayers for a family. So with that, let us begin in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that we would be, ever be changed by your word, Father. Please clear all distractions from us. Forgive us of our sins. May we be covered with the righteousness of Christ as we come uh, to study your word. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's message is entitled, Jesus Redeems What the Law Cannot. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to please open to the book of Ruth, and we will look at chapter 4. So if you're able to, please stand with me as we read God's Word. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I, can't, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders say, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephra and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore, Jude, bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. 
They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. This is the inerrant and infallible word of God. You may be seated. This text teaches us that because Jesus Christ is a restorer and nourisher of our life, we are to recognize the transaction confirmed, recognize our transformed status, and to trust in Jesus who redeemed us. Transaction, transformation, and trust. First point. Because Jesus Christ is a restorer and nourisher of our life, we are to recognize the transaction Jesus confirmed. Transaction. In verse 1, Boaz goes to the city gate, likely in the early morning, and sits there. In ancient cities, they had a perimeter all around the city. The city gate was the main entrance of the city where Everyone would go in and out. It was like a newspaper where people would sit down, spread the news, and, and it would take place at the city gates. The city gates was, was also a very important place where business and legal transactions were made. Esteemed and honorable men, elderly men of the city, judges, city officials, they could all be found at the city gates. The city gate was like a combined town hall, but also a courthouse. Boaz probably knew that the nearer kinsman redeemer would be at the city gate at a certain day in a certain time. So Boaz is waiting there, and then he meets and calls out the nearer kinsman redeemer once he sees him. Boaz calls him friend. Note the nearer redeemer is not given a name. This translation friend in Hebrew is the words uh, Poloni Almoni. Poloni Almoni. Instead of friend, Poloni Almoni would probably be better translated as Mr. So-and-so or what's-his-face. This type of translation gives us a negative impression of this nearer kinsman redeemer because Poloni Almoni was an embarrassment to him and to his heirs to not fulfill the kinsman redeemer role. Therefore, this nearer kinsman was unworthy of even mentioning his name, even though Boaz, who was a close relative of him, clearly would have known his name. In verse 2, as a standard process, we're told that Boaz takes 10 of the town's elder of the city, leaders of the city, to sit and hear the proceedings and witness this illegal and business transaction. Boaz is speaking on behalf of Naomi and Ruth. Boaz is taking care of everything as a redeemer. And so Boaz really is a beautiful picture of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who took care of everything on the cross for his people. In verse 3, we, we see that Boaz tells the nearer kinsman Redeemer that Naomi, who just came back from Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to their relative Elimelech. Therefore, the kinsman Redeemer must redeem it. This was an offer that the nearer kinsman redeemer could not refuse. He would be getting land, which he could farm, harvest for years to come, and he could pass down the land to his sons because Naomi was too old to conceive for uh, sons for inheriting the land. In verse 4, when Boaz says, I thought I would tell you of it, 
Boaz is saying to the nearer kinsman redeemer that there is something that he needs to know. Boaz initially presents the transaction to the nearer kinsman redeemer as a matter of regarding real estate, the farming land. Any kinsman redeemer would want to buy back a piece of property and keep it in the family names. So therefore, it's no surprise that the, kin the nearer kinsman redeemer, who's a picture of the law, and the law has to be satisfied, says, I will redeem it. This is not a surprising response, as it would have been an embarrassment for the nearer kinsman redeemer to say no to redeeming Naomi. However, in verse 5, Boaz being shrewd surprises the nearer kinsman redeemer by saying, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also, requ you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his in inheritance. See, the job of the kinsman redeemer was not to just buy back the land of the deceased and to keep it in the family, but according to the Leveret Law of Marriage, a kinsman redeemer also had a job of perpetuating the deceased man's name. See, now that changes everything for Poloni Almoni. Boaz knew what he was exactly what he was doing. If you want the land, you have to take the girl as well. It is not just Naomi, the widow who is past a child-rearing age, but there's also Ruth, the Moabite from a cursed race who is of child-rearing age, which means that the nearer kinsman redeemer may not have thought about that he had the responsibility of providing Ruth an heir, a son who would eventually receive the land that the nearer kinsman redeemer would be purchasing. In verse 6, this was a package deal. The kinsman redeemer had to fulfill the duty of both the land, but also the family. Land was an opportunity, but family was a duty. You could not get one without the other. As the kinsman redeemer, Poloni Almoni must also marry Ruth the Moabite in order to raise up a child for Ruth's deceased husband, a child who would inherit the land when he grew up. Consequently, the nearer kinsman redeemer does not say, I will not redeem it. He says, I cannot redeem it. He cannot marry Ruth because he will lose his part of his inheritance. See, the nearer kinsman redeemer represents the law, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments. The law shows you what is right and wrong. The law shows us that we are sinners. However, nobody can keep the law because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Importantly, we learn here that the law cannot redeem. The law shows us where we sin, but it can never keep us from sinning. The law has no power. You get the sense that Boaz knew Poloni Almoni could not and would not redeem both the property and Ruth. In verse 7, the custom in Israel to confirm a transaction concerning land involved one taking off his sandal and giving it to the other one who was going to get the land. The sandal symbolized standing on the property, your land, and by giving your sandal to another, this was symbolic gesture as the land was, now, was mine, now it is yours. After refusing to serve as the kinsman redeemer, Poloni Almoni then offers Boaz the property and Ruth as a wife. Boaz could now fulfill his duty as a kinsman redeemer. Boaz came to redeem. He fulfilled the law. 
He purchased Naomi and Ruth, he, both a, a Jew and a Gentile, and he was willing to buy Elimelech's field to get a bride, a Gentile bride. This is a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for his church. Boaz is a picture of Jesus. Jesus fulfilled all the law that was required in order to redeem us, purchasing us, both those that are Jews, but also us that are Gentiles, by fulfilling the law, something that we could never do for ourselves. God became man. Jesus came to earth and voluntarily took our place on the cross. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Jesus was the only one able to redeem us because he was the only one who could fulfill the requirements of the law. Think about this. Ruth was a poor, lost widow who became a rich bride of Boaz with peace and security. Likewise, we were lost and helpless, and we became rich heirs of salvation with protection and security in Jesus Christ. Second point, because Jesus Christ is a restorer and nourisher of our soul, we are to recognize our transformed status, transformation. After Ruth meets her kinsman redeemer, Boaz, Ruth's life was immediately transformed in a major positive way. Likewise, by the Holy Spirit, your faith transforms you and the way you live in your life. In verse 9 and 10, Boaz buys back the land for Naomi and Ruth, and Boaz marries Ruth. In verse 10, Boaz publicly and joyfully proclaims to the elders and all the witnesses his love for Ruth. This is appropriate as tomorrow is Valentine's Day. He says, I, Boaz, have, have bought Ruth to be my wife, thus fulfilling all the promises Boaz made to Ruth on the threshing floor in the middle of the night before. In verse 11, notice Ruth is no longer identified as a stranger, a foreigner, or a slave, or a Moabitess woman. Ruth now is transformed into Boaz's wife and grafted into the family of God. The witnesses pray blessings for Ruth, and she's now mentioned alongside with Rachel and Leah, who are the founding mothers of the nation of Israel, who were the wives of Jacob, who gave birth to 12 sons, and who were the 12 tribes of Israel. And the elders say that Leah and Rachel built the house of Israel. Similarly, for us who are redeemed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at the moment of our redemption, our standing is immediately transformed. We are no longer strangers and outcasts. Instead, God, God has called us his children. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. There's no greater privilege than to be called a child of God. The only way this is possible for us is to be redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Third and last point, because Jesus Christ is the restorer and nourisher of our soul, we are to trust in Jesus who redeemed us. Trust. In verse 12, Tamar is referenced. Tamar is also in Genesis uh, chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38 teaches us about the laws of the Leverite marriage and raising up offspring for the deceased. Recall in Genesis chapter 38, Judah had three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Ur 
was the eldest son, and he married Tamar, but had no children. An heir subsequently died. Then Onan, the second eldest, married Tamar, but also had no children. And Ur subsequently died. Then, because Ur and Onan, two of the three sons of Judah, died, Judah kept back Shelah the youngest son, from marrying Tamar because Judah thought that Tamar must be cursed. Judah then forsakes and abandons Tamar, so Tamar is in a similar situation as Ruth is. No heirs, no children. Consequently, Tamar dresses herself up as a prostitute and tricks Judah into providing Tamar an offspring, actually twins. The first of the twins name is Perez. So we see Ruth's story is very similar to Tamar's story. A woman who was rejected by man, but God had mercy on and delivered the woman. God brought brought the woman into redemption and fellowship, and God provided the woman a promised family line. This is what God has done for us throughout redemptive history. What man has rejected, God has used as a perfect target for God's grace. In verse 13, Ruth and Boaz are blessed with a son. This is a great blessing considering in the 10 years prior that Ruth was married to Malon, she did not bear a child. But through trusting in the Lord and his providence, Ruth conceived and bore a son with Boaz. Note the emphasis on the Lord gave conception. The Lord Yahweh is explicitly brought to the foreground here, doing the action, providing a family. In verse 14, the women acknowledge that Naomi is blessed by the Lord, a reversal of all her tragedies, the death of her husband, the death of her two sons, being in a famine, and being in the time of the judges. And verse 15, he shall be a restorer of life, means that God is causing life to return. Naomi had to lose her two sons to appreciate the one who would be born of Ruth, and to appreciate Ruth, who was better than seven sons. Remember the Number seven represents perfection and completion and fullness. It was through the crucible of suffering, painful as it was for Naomi, who said she lost everything, that it was necessary for Naomi's spiritual growth and recognition of her place in God's plan. Brothers and sisters, likewise, you and I were dead spiritually. And Jesus has restored our life. We were dead in trespasses and sins. However, the good news is if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus will restore you and bring newness of your life, strength and restoration. God also wants to nourish and sustain you whatever season and life you are in. In verse 17, Ruth has a son with Boaz. A son has been born to Naomi means that Naomi helped raise Boaz and Ruth's son. The women who got together named this child Obed. Obed means to serve or one who serves. Obed was the father of Jesse, who was father of King David. When Naomi dies... She has no idea that her personal tragedies, the death of her husband, the death of her two sons, through Ruth, a Moabite, would ultimately lead to a genealogy that included the greatest king in Israel, King David, but more importantly, the eternal king of the universe in Jesus Christ, who would be fulfilled hundreds of years later. Likewise, we may have no idea what God is doing through our famines and struggles in this life right now. Oftentimes, all we see is Mara, the bitter aspects of this life. 
limited as we are to this one lifetime, this genealogy that we see here through Ruth, through Obed, leading to Jesus Christ, is a striking way of seeing how this is all being brought before us through the continuity of God's purposes throughout all the ages. In verses 18 to 22, we read the genealogy of Perez all the way down to King David. You might ask, why start the genealogy with Perez? As mentioned earlier, Tamar became pregnant by Judah, and she has these twins. The first of the twins is Perez. Nine generations from Perez, the genealogy goes to King David. But this is not the end of the story. There's a much greater king pointed to in the book of Ruth than King David. If we look in Matthew chapter 1, we see the genealogy continues from there all the way. And it's been about our Messiah, Jesus Christ. First, Boaz is a picture of Jesus. Both were men who came to redeem. Both Boaz purchased Naomi and Redeemer, and Jesus purchases all the elect, both Jews and Gentiles. Second, both Boaz and Jesus fulfilled the law. Third, Ruth became the bride of Boaz. Likewise, we, the church, are the bride of Jesus Christ. And fourth, God shows the genealogy of Boaz and Ruth's line all the way to our Messiah, Jesus Christ. As we come to a close, remember God's providence is at work behind every scene. God weaves together the faithful obedience of his people to bring about his plan for redemptive purposes. And just like Naomi, Ruth and Boaz all played important parts in God's great unique plan of redemption. We also play an important part in God's plan of redemption. The story he wants us to be part of. The same God that was working in Naomi and Ruth's lives is the same God that is working in yours in my life. Life of a Christian is not a straight journey. Rather, it's a series of twists and turns, setbacks, and obstacles. However, because God is in control of our lives, even when we experience setbacks, we can be confident that God loves us. We can trust God that he has our best interests in mind because he is a sovereign, loving, and faithful God who is full of grace and mercy. Amen. And so whatever difficulties you are going through today, Always remember that everything has a purpose and it's part of God's plan to bring himself glory. We can trust God in the worst of the times because the best times has yet to come. God brings his people from emptiness to fullness and despair to hope. God is working in the background, arranging things behind the scenes, bringing, bringing people into your life who will play pivotal roles in your life, but also as well as you being brought in their lives so that you may play pivotal roles in their lives as well. We live in a dark age, just like the time of the judges, when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. However, God is using ordinary people like you and me to accomplish the extraordinary purpose for his kingdom building. With that, let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these past four weeks of our study of the book of Ruth. We thank you for this ultimate love story in the Old Testament. Father, we thank you for this example of Boaz as a picture of Jesus as our Redeemer. Thank you for teaching us that book of Ruth 
points us forward to Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and your perfect covenantal love for us. Help us to daily remember because Jesus Christ is our restorer and nourisher of our life, our Goel, who redeemed us with his blood, that we are to recognize the transaction, our transformation, and our trust in Jesus. Forgive us, for we do not always remember these things in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We are sinners. We need you. Help us to trust in you in our deepest despairs and take refuge in the shadows of your wings. Thank you for the hope we have in Jesus. We love you, praise you, and may our chief end always be to glorify you and enjoy you forever and ever. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen.